Biggs. After completing her PhD, she then started as a postdoc before she became a lecturer in the department in 2001. And I guess the rest is uh, history, and uh, uh, we're here to celebrate tonight uh, this history. So I want to tell you something very brief about Alessandra's uh, research. Uh, her research really has been focused on knowledge-based uh, AI. It's an extremely broad topic, but Alessandra has looked specifically at user-centered algorithms for automated explanation generation, as well as for knowledge-driven learning. She's using these methods so that learning and reasoning in an artificial intelligence system can be optimized. And of course, we all know that's something very, very timely. More importantly, she has also investigated the biases that can exist in these AI systems and how these biases can be made explicit, controlled, and also minimized. Uh, again, it's something very, very timely, very important. One of the key features of Alessandra's work has been the highly uh, interdisciplinary and collaborative uh, uh, nature of her work. She has collaborated with many colleagues in academia and in industry, and it's great to see so many people, uh, of so many collaborators of her here uh, this, this evening. Um, I guess you would all agree with me, one of her really uh, many qualities uh, has been the sort of tenacity and and also the dedication she brings to the subject, whatever subject uh, she is, is really studying. And this has also enabled her to make a number of really uh, important fundamental contributions. And I think we will hear about more of, of, about this uh, uh, later on. As I mentioned before, uh, one of Alessandra's uh, uh, PhD supervisor has been Dov Gabay, and I don't think he is here today. Uh, the other supervisor is sitting here, so I'm not going to say something about the other supervisor because I might get into trouble otherwise. Um, but I've been told uh, by uh, reliable sources that um, Dov had a rather uh, passive uh, supervision style. And then on occasion, he sort of tended to uh, almost drift to sleep when he was meeting uh, uh, you. <laughs> And I think Alessandra was very, very worried about this because uh, obviously she is also very energetic. Uh, um, and I think she was really worried that something wrong with her for making Dov fall asleep. But I think you told me, or I heard uh, the story that you were very, very uh, relieved when you found out he actually fell asleep with all of his students. So, um, so um, it's, it wasn't you, Alessandra. Um, I guess many of, uh, of our colleagues will know uh, Alessandra as an academic who really very deeply cares uh, about students, but also colleagues. I think she has supervised more than 80 undergraduate and MSc projects. Uh, she had a lo long list of personal tutees. I think it's, again, over, over 80s, uh, 80 um, tutees. And she's delivered many outstanding lectures. And I'm, going to show, I'm sure we'll see one in a moment. And I think it's also very nice to see that this has been rewarded by a number of prizes. So for example, uh, she received the uh, Imperial College Rector's uh, Award for Excellence in Teaching in, in 2011, as well as a number of other awards. So it's, it's really great. Um, Alessandra also has had the long-suffering uh, um, duty of being our uh, director of postgraduate studies. And According to my calculations, you really supervised almost 300 PhD students uh, during that time. So, and uh, I think they actually tended to be a very happy bunch. So I think Alessandra did a fantastic job in helping that. Um, but many of you will probably also be aware of a key flaw in Alessandra's uh, character. Um, and that is uh, that of a person who finds it very hard to say no. Um, which actually for a head of department is really ideal. Uh, uh, I hope I haven't taken too much advantage of, of this. Um, but it's really, as, uh, it's really uh, fair to say that Alessandra has been an absolute pleasure to have somebody as dedicated and committed as her in our department. Um, perhaps not so many of you, uh, at least of the colleagues, will know that uh, Alessandra is also uh, a trained and outstanding pianist, I've heard. Um, Perhaps later on this evening you will uh, give us. Uh, that's why this is for. I, don't, I hope you realize this, correct? 
Um, in fact, a classical pianist. So I think you're in for a treat later on this, this evening. Uh, but of course, you also had a, a, she has a life outside uh, college, which is great to hear. Um, she's married to Rob, who's sitting here uh, in the front, and also has uh, two daughters who are sitting here in the front, uh, uh, Rebecca and Natasha. And I actually know some of them from very early on, but they've grown a lot. So uh, welcome to you um, as well. So ladies and gentlemen, it's now my great pleasure to ask Alessandra to give her an inaugural lecture. Thank you, Daniel, for the kind words. I really appreciate it. And thank you, everybody, for being here tonight, in particular those who've come from a long way. Uh, what I'm going to talk about tonight is knowledge-based AI and the contribution, some of the most important contributions of which I made during my career up to here. And uh, hopefully I'm going to show you how this particular form of AI is extremely important and it can be used to help humans in their activities. But before diving into it, uh, oh, I should have gone all this forward, <laughs> sorry. Before diving into it, I really would like to, I think Daniel already mentioned where I studied, and I want to really tell you where my passion for this uh, area of research comes from. Uh, in Italy, when I did my degree in computer science, the degree at that time was uh, very much based on theoretical aspects of computer science, and I really started to develop an interest towards logic and symbolic reasoning. I was uh, fascinated by that. Towards the end of my degree, actually this wasn't done in summary, so I went to Paris as an Erasmus student, and uh, I worked for six months in my final year project dissertation with medical informatics uh, researchers. So in addition to just enjoying myself, because that was my first time I went abroad, I really was uh, started to work on how logic can be used in order to develop intelligent systems. And is this a synergy between the logic and intelligent systems that has remained since then the main pivot of my research activities? So I want just to tell you a little bit of what do we mean by intelligent systems. So if we look at that time in the 80s, and I'm afraid I'm going to reveal my age a little bit here. So intelligent systems were knowledge-based systems where actually expert knowledge was formalized in the shape of rules and forms. And the systems had uh, some inference engines that allowed uh, to reason over this knowledge and generating answers uh, to queries uh, that humans were posing to the system. So those systems were very good at emulating human reasoning and generating explanations uh, for the reasoning steps that they were performing. But it had a big, a big bottleneck. And the bottleneck was uh, the knowledge acquisition. This was primarily a manual task between experts in such a domain and the engineers that were developing the system. So in addition, they lacked the common sense reasoning. And common sense reasoning is, uh, what do I mean by that, is the ability of extending expert knowledge with the everyday experience, uh, which is exactly what humans are very good at. So, and this is because they didn't have any learning abilities. So we've moved quite a long far way from there, and now intelligent systems look a little bit different than that, quite a bit. And in particular, these are systems that they are very capable of harnessing a large quantity of data. Data now we know they're around they're everywhere. So Wikipedia, Google, or whatever we want to look is under our fingertips. Uh, and they are very good at uh, using uh, pattern matching uh, and uh, trained machine learning algorithms in order to Query, classifying the query that you use a poster to the system, retrieve information from this remote repository of large knowledge graphs, and use this information to perform a certain specific task and interact with humans in a much more human-like way. This is clearly because there's been incredible advancement on natural language processing and natural language generations. So all these systems seems to, be, seems to gain a kind of intelligent appearance. But in reality, their lack of ability of reasoning, explanations, and learning. Learning in the sense of being able to continue taking feedback from the human and improve their knowledge so to, be, to perform much better. So where do we want to go, really? This is, I'm setting the scene here in my talk. 
So my, you know, the vision is that the intelligent systems of the next generation should actually combine together. There's a machine learning algorithms advancement that we have nowadays with the symb advanced symbolic inference mechanisms that allow to generate a, a explanation to perform reasoning and also to support this continuous learning. And this is exactly where my research activity has been focused on. How can we advance the, the symbolic inference mechanism from the 80s and become really at the stage where we can create intelligent systems nowadays, all right? So I'm going to tell you a little bit the work that I've done in this symbolic inference domain, but let's see what does the symbolic inference mean, all right? So uh, symbolic inference is the process of using observations, using the prior knowledge, in order to make a logical conclusions. So conclusion that we think makes sense, given the knowledge that we have about a problem. There are three different types of symbolic inferences, where they are classified as a deductive inference, explanatory inferences, and inductive inferences, right? And they address a different type of tasks. So let's have a look at deductive inference very briefly. So I said, okay, suppose that we know that all cats have claws, right? This is our general prior knowledge. And we also know, we make an observation that Fred is a cat. So deductively, it must be the case that the Fred has claws. And this is what deductive inference is. In the explanation case, instead, what we are looking at, try to find explanations for observations. So in this case, the general knowledge is, let's say, all cats have claws. In our observation that there is a cat, Fred, that has claws, so we try to explain that. And the explanation will be that Fred is, has claws because he's a cat. Right? In the inductive inference study, the task is much harder. And it is about generating a new knowledge from ground observations that we're making around, you know, on, on facts around us. So for instance, we might look around at some observation that there are cats, we look at those cats have clothes. What can we learn about cats in general? So that this general knowledge can be applied in a domain and used to make a correct predictions. And in this case, we say, okay, we learn that all cats have clothes, right? So no, when we talk about the knowledge-based AI and symbolic inference, really we talk about reasoning, explaining, and learning. And throughout all my career, I've done contributions in all these three aspects of symbolic inferences. So I'm going to briefly tell you some of the, some of the work we've done in reasoning, and then explanation, and we'll concentrate more on symbolic learning. Okay, symbolic reasoning. How do we build a system that are able to perform symbolic reasons? What do we need and where do we start from? We need really two types of uh, uh, things. The first, we needed to come up with a language that is able to formalize this knowledge and uh, that we want to reason upon. And second, we need to have efficient mechanisms for constructing this logical conclusion, this logical argument. So the question that I started in my beginning of my career is what language shall we pick, right? And uh, during my, uh, so we can classify languages as uh, formalist in three different categories. Classical logic, extensions of classical logics, and alternative to classical logics. So in classical logics, so we have things like a model logic, which is a logic to reason about necessity and possibilities. And for instance, in alternative, uh, alternative to classical logic, we have something called the non-monotonic logic, which is really important. It's a logic that allows us to express default assumptions, and non-monotonic reasoning can be used, is able to mimic human's ability to simplify reasoning by using this default assumption. So when I did my PhD, I was very interested about the relationship between all these different logics. And in particular, what I was aiming to is the possibility of developing a uniform framework where we can represent all these different non-classical logics and reason upon them. And the really, and the results in my PhD were then published in my first book, manuscript, I was very proud of that, together, which I wrote away that my co-supervisor, despite his sleeping <laughs> normal in the meetings, and, uh, and, and uh, we know a colleague of mine that was actually uh, also working uh, on similar topics. So, but the, the interesting insight that I got from my PhD is actually, yeah, it is good to look at all these different logics, uh, but really, just classical computational logic and non-monotonic logics are really sufficient to emulate many of these non-classical logics. So at that point in my research, I came now to find the first answer to my first questions. So I knew that if I wanted to develop intelligent systems, I could just look at the non-monotonic logic formalists to do that. So let's have a look at now how we do that. How do we 
uh, right uh, uh, um, sort of systems behavior and examples of using non-monotonic logic. At the time, I was actually fortunate, really, to work with colleagues in the software engineering in the department uh, and, uh, and, and systems uh, uh, engineering, uh, and also with the colleagues in uh, IBM Watson Research in New York. We had interesting projects going around there. And really what we were looking at, how can we develop AI solution for formalizing the reasoning about the policy-based management systems? So these are specific systems where the behavior of the system, the policies, are defined and specified and implemented separately from the functionality of the system. And the idea is that we can change these policies and the system will adapt itself. So we'll change its own behavior without necessarily re-implementing the system functionalities. So we wanted to do what we were looking at was a language in trying to formalize authorizations, obligations. These are policies that tell the system permission to perform actions, uh, uh, obligation to perform actions, and so forth, and in particular, the relationship between these different concepts. So I that the, the, the type of languages which were present so, uh, so far, they were very simple. So we wanted to expand and enrich the uh, expressivity of these languages. And in particular, we wanted to be able to express the temporal properties of the system to make these decisions based on the dynamic of the, of the, of the system and take into account the default behaviors. <coughs> So we can come up with a very general language for that, and this is an example. So we might look at an authorization policy. So you can read all this English here. This is quite a long sentence. You think, how am I going to reason about that? So then what we actually, if you think about how you will represent it then logically, is very compact representation of what actually the decision, which is permission or denial of certain action, is done based upon the conditions. They are temporal conditions. They depend on the temporal behavior of the system and the state in which the system is finding itself. And the important bit to highlight is in this language that we can talk about time explicitly. We can reason about time. And we can talk about default assumptions. This is almost a default assumption example. So I can permit, so the system can permit a set action to be performed provided that, assuming that no particular request in between has <coughs> happened of other things, okay? So this is a really makes the language very powerful. This is an example, for instance, of an obligation policy for systems, uh, where, and again, we can define these obligations uh, in, in one linked to each other, and the conditions of this obligation can take into account the violations of that obligation, fulfillment of other obligations, and so forth. So I hope I give you a feeling that this language can be very expressive and very rich in the modeling assistance behavior, all right? Okay, so then when we actually have some default, I was talking about the importance of default assumptions, systems not necessarily have policies on everything, on every possible action. So it's really important to code and so sort of represent default behavior. So we call that the policy regulation rules. And if the, the essence of this research was that if we can formalize all of this, we can actually reason about the behavior of the system and make predictions. So given an initial state of the system, which can be given as some particular sequence of requests that the system might receive, then we can infer what state of the system will be, will be eventually. So what kind of actions will be performed eventually. So this is an example of symbolic reasoning, if you want, all right, in practice. Okay, but this specification, of this, the, the engineering of such type of systems uh, is actually done uh, manually. So you can tell me there's not really much intelligence here because humans make mistakes. So these policies can well be wrong. So what can we do about it? How can we make sure that this is that we can reason, we can find out about is there any other way that we can uh, uh, analyze these policies? So what we want to sometimes to do is look at a way of uh, detecting faults in systems and be able to generate explanations about these faults. So in a sense that if we take a, a system administrator that is there to develop a such type of systems, uh, this kind of uh, in, uh, uh, you know, intelligent support will help uh, the administrator to develop the system better and faster. So in order to do explanation generation, and this is doesn't really apply just to policies, this applies in any kind of systems, right? So this is the policy is just a particular example here. 
So in order to do exponential generation, we need two things, really, in my view. One is the query language, so a query with which you pose a certain, uh, you define a certain property that you want to have an explanation about. And the other is an engine for computing these explanations, okay? Uh, in particular, in the case of policy domains, computing violations of certain property. Can we explain why there might some violations might occur? So at that time, I was uh, in, uh, working with this colleague, as I said, at Imperial, and also, actually, this is uh, the first time I also wrote a paper, my first paper with my husband. And uh, this was actually the, the only paper I wrote with my husband. <laughs> I'll let you think about it, but anyway. So, so the, 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 the nice thing is that the paper was uh, received an award for best application paper. And I think I should have continued to write the paper with my husband, actually. <laughs> OK, because then you know, it would have helped me, anyway, to get that question. But uh, anyway, so what we were actually uh, looking at is a, a formal framework for reconstructing explanations, for generating explanations. So how are we going to generate these explanations automatically? Um, and um, so we, we came up with a very theoretical framework that mathematically showed that we can actually, so the problem of detecting a violation that in logic terms, so you say a given knowledge representation does not prove a certain property. So that means the property is violated. So the property of detecting this violation is equivalent to constructing an explanation, this is the explanation E, that together with the system description can prove the negation of the property. So instead of querying the property, we want to query the negation and constructing explanation for that negation, because the negation of the property is our violation, all right? So, and we wanted really, so lots of work is done in AI in the terms of checking the correctness of systems, so this is called a system verification. But what I was really interested in was something different. So I wanted to construct explanations that are minimal. And these explanations have also to be, they can be multiple. There can be multiple ways in which a system can lead to a state of failure. So can I actually compute all these multiple explanations? And if I want the explanation to be useful for the human, can the human have a way of actually defining what are the relevant information that should appear in this explanation and use this as a bias in order to control the search among, among the possible candidate explanations? So, uh, this is in the case, and we actually came up with this general theoretical framework and we applied on the policy ba uh, based management systems where we define a different type of properties, talk about the modality conflict, where the system is authorizing and, de and uh, denying an action at the same time, talking about separation of duty, which is another type of property, when the system assign a membership to different roles which are in, conf in conflict with each other, and so forth. And the kind of computation explanation that we're generating were really minimal traces of execution of the system that uh, uh, and, uh, they were taking the system in a failure state, and together with that, also the policy that the system was using in order to get to that failure state. And this information, if you return and you give it back to the human, the human now has a guide of where to go and change in the particular the, you know, implementation of the system. Okay, so this is all very good, but systems actually nowadays are decentralized, are complex. Knowledge is distributed everywhere, all right? So it's not just in one particular knowledge base as it used to be. So how can we actually do this reasoning and explanation generation in a decentralized manner, all right? So, and uh, well, that's exactly what we were uh, then moved on into looking. We wanted to create uh, some mechanism for the reasoning and uh, generate explanation in a distributed manner. So I have, uh, we worked, uh, I worked in collaboration with uh, Krish, of course, and uh, also an uh, ex-PhD student of mine who might be sitting here in the US, and JFMA, uh, in uh, solving this particular problem and trying to develop uh, an, an algorithm and a system that was able to perform distributed reasoning and distributed explanation generation. Okay, and, uh, and so the system was had a very interesting capability. Agents as in, so was computing this uh, reasoning and explanation by allowing agents to uh, dynamically grouping and forming clusters uh, depending on the need of the knowledge that these agents had. And they were collaborating a kind of peer-to-peer -peer fashion. This is not a centralized way. It's a completely fully peer-to-peer. -peer. 
And we were able to demonstrate that the algorithm, that the SAS the algorithm was computing was sound the, you know, with respect to all the constraints that these agents had, even if agents had to leave the cluster and join the cluster for lack of connections and so forth during the reasoning process. So this was a quite an interesting advancement that we did in the domain of symbolic reasoning in a decentralized uh, setting. And the same algorithm can be used also for explanation. So for instance, you are consider the case of a domain where actually distributed system is there to help human assisting the elderly in, in, you know, in their home. And you want to actually uh, explain uh, so events that happen in the system. So this now is a decentralized system with lots of different uh, uh, nodes and agents here, their own local uh, information uh, and constraints. And uh, events occur, and the system uh, collaboratively try to explain that event. This is really important in assisted living because of what happens. Very often there are unnecessary false alarms, right? Or something happens that you don't, you know, it's not necessarily a, a, a dangerous event that we have to intervene about. So having a, a correct and minimal explanation about what happens in, the, in this kind of environment is really vital, right? And the interesting thing is that we were implementing the system in a kind of, uh, and executing a very small devices, very small computers. These were called gumsticks. So there, are, there were devices that could have been embedded into personal PDAs or personal computers that were actually located into this uh, distributed system here. Okay, so now we are in a situation where, so this, uh, um, this uh, I briefly touched upon the reasoning and I touched upon explanation. And really what I would like to uh, move on is uh, towards the concept of uh, symbolic uh, learning. Right, so that's the bit which uh, has been uh, very close to my heart in the last, you know, the last, for many years actually. So, what is a symbolic learning? Now, we all know that what machine learning is. We all hear in the news about uh, the fantastic uh, results of machine learning does, but actually, very rarely we hear about symbolic learning. <laughs> and, uh, and but this is not because it's not uh, uh, um, effective in what uh, it, symbolic learning can do. And that's what I would like to try to convince you tonight. The message you have to take with, we, with you. So symbolic learning is actually a, a, a sub a, a subfield of uh, machine learning, but actually it's a subfield of AI in general, knowledge-based AI, and it's sitting at the intersection between machine learning and knowledge representation. So the knowledge representation is really all the things I've been telling you about so far. The language, the formalism for representing knowledge, the reasoning about these languages. And uh, the way in which the symbolic learning works is a particular type of, uh, um, so the, what people do in symbolic learning, they look for algorithms and systems they can take an input uh, label data, so label examples, positive or negative uh, examples about a certain concept, they take an input also whatever prior knowledge the humans have about that particular problem domain they try to solve, and they generate new knowledge. They really generate, this new knowledge has to kind of be such that, that the label examples are, are uh, explained, right? The positive are covered and the negative are not covered. Okay, so the difference between this and machine learning, you rarely have, actually you don't have, prior knowledge in machine learning. It's, you know, now recently we started to look at a way of injecting prior knowledge in machine learning by primarily the standard machine learning such as deep learning, reinforcement learning and so forth are very much data firsty. So this is a, a huge amount of repository of data in order to make a prediction. Here we are not data firsty. We have a very few, we, we can learn new knowledge from just a very few examples if we have already some extra knowledge about the problem that we try to solve, okay? All right, so uh, let's have a look at an example. Let's see how symbolic learning works in practice. This is a very simple example. It's not really, it's, uh, you know, it's much more complicated than that. But suppose we look at the situation of family relationships, all right? And uh, we have uh, prior knowledge here. We know who is parent to who, and we know gender, so, so forth. We have some information, some knowledge base. And now we have uh, some positive examples. We know that Ale is the daughter of Tony and uh, Hannah is the daughter of Sandra. And we have uh, some negative examples. Tony is the daughter of Sandra and Ale is not the daughter of Sandra, all right? So this is positive example, negative example. Imagine this is a situation your little child, you know, one year old, two year old, started to talk and asking you, what does the daughter mean, all right? 
So what we really want to do here, given this information, how can we actually learn a general definition of a daughter relationship in a family, right? So what are the important information conditions here that they can allow us to decide and predict in any circumstances we find ourselves that X is a daughter of Y, okay? So you, we can start uh, constructing this uh, kind of, uh, so this algorithm started to look for solutions for possible definitions of daughter, looking, taking into account whatever language the system knows about, okay? This is a language that we know about, so we can only use this information. So we can start uh, from a very uh, specific uh, definition of daughter. We can say, okay, it's because to if Tony is uh, the parent of Alan, Alan is a female, <coughs> then Alan is the daughter of Tony. So this we think, okay, it makes sense. So, you know, you sometimes answer questions to children by just giving little uh, ground instances, example of a more complex concept. But this is in principle no good because we wanted to cover all the positive examples and not cover any of the negative. And if we look at this particular definition here, it talks only about the Tony and Ale, whereas we doesn't tell anything about Anna and Sandra. So this kind of rule here is not able to explain why Anna is the daughter of Sandra. Okay, so we can try to be then a more general. We can say, oh, well, everybody's a daughter of everybody else, right? This is the most general level of knowledge you can generate, but this is also not very useful because uh, in this case, you know, this is not what it is, and essentially also will cover your negative example here, which we don't want it to be covered. So what we want to do is try to uh, search for, identify, refine the you know, notion definitions of data that will uh, you know, comply with our examples. So if we can start to add the conditions here, this if we can start to fill up the gap here, and we can say, okay, if Y is a female, then X is a daughter of Y, and uh, I should maybe ask the audience, but this is also not a good solution because uh, it will not explain the first positive example, right? Since Tony is not a female, right? So the Y would be Tony in this case. So therefore we would stop searching for solutions in this branch and we'll be looking for other ways of constructing this general knowledge. And in these particular two cases, uh, these are rules that actually would help, would cover both positive examples but this is no good because it doesn't, it, it, it covers the negative example here, and this is no good because it covers the other negative example, which were not what we don't want. So we want then to specialize even further, but this is specialization, adding extra condition to our definition of data, shouldn't reach this bottom level because this is not very useful. Should still be general. In logic, these are X and Y, these are variables, can take any possible value. So this means X is a daughter of Y, if Y is the parents of X and, uh, and uh, X is a female. And this is now the definition, if you like, of daughter. So if you take this rule, you can apply in any circumstances and be able to answer and predict who is the daughter of who, okay? So as you can see, learning is a really a search problem. We have symbolic learning. We have an, a, an, a, a search of pos a space of possible solutions and we wanted to find the, the best optimal knowledge in that space of possible solution that will cover whatever example data we have. So the question is, how can we do this search in an efficient manner? If we look at how the landscape was at the beginning of the 2000, symbolic learning was still very premature in my view. There were, very, there were quite few systems there. People were working in this quite actively. But the, the kind of knowledge that they were able to learn, or you know, representation of the knowledge that they were able to learn, was very simple. Was no, we were not able to capture this concept of default that I was referring before. And they were only primarily good at learning a single rule, so rather than a complex knowledge with interdependency of rules, as I was for this described before, the case of authorization and obligations and so forth. So really, we wanted, we set the, the, our task in, uh, on how we can uh, develop systems they are able to learn more complex knowledge, much more complex knowledge than was, was at the beginning of the 2000s. And uh, we took inspiration from uh, modern philosophy there uh, because uh, we thought that if we wanted to learn knowledge, and knowledge here, learning here is not just prediction. It's not learning a function that does classification. It's learning a general knowledge. So how do human learn knowledge? So we look in the model, the, the, the idea of Charles, the, the, the definition of Charles Peirce's theory of uh, scientific method, 
they actually captured how human beings behave when they want to generate a new scientific knowledge. And really what happened here, so what Charles Pierce advocated, uh, is the process that comes, comes into place is that the human start uh, to learn new knowledge where they observe an anomaly, they observe something that they cannot explain. And they can take uh, this explanation and then they make an hypothesis about uh, the observation they're making. Uh, so this is now, you know, started to think about uh, a solution and an hypothesis. And uh, then they use a deduction to generate a further test. If that hypothesis is the case, then this further test should result to be in this way. And once the further tests are performed to confirm or deny the hypothesis, if the hypothesis is confirmed, this is now lifted to a general principle, a general knowledge, then then the human can then use it for any further circumstances, right, similar to reason upon. So, the, so Charles Pierce in this uh, uh, framework thought that uh, to do knowledge discovery, we needed these three computational processes. We need abduction, deduction, and induction, right? Abduction is for, you know, coming up with hypothesis, uh, uh, explanation of in terms of hypothesis, deduction for generating new test cases, and induction for generalizing it. So we actually mimic, this is, what did, this is work I did with my first ever PhD student in the department, Oliver Ray, who is now an academic in Bristol, and I'm very pleased for him. So we developed a system that really mimic this idea of knowledge discovery, and that combines all these three different reasoning tasks in a seamless way. We kind of solved the problem that for 10 years people were not able to solve. So how can we combine abduction and, and induction? So what are the differences between the different the, the symbolic reasoning? And then with a second PhD student, we also extended this even further because why not the system is in, in a kind of a recursive way? So we thought, what happened if the system stops? I said, I can't find a solution. Can we actually reason on when it's failing and use that as additional example in order to continue learning and get a richer knowledge? So, and we then want to, so we were at the stage now that we, can, we could learn complex uh, sort of representation of knowledge with rules that were interdependent with each other, okay? And we applied it to the domain of uh, grammar language. So grammar language uh, is, uh, is, is basically a, a presentation of the rules that define the English, the English language, syntactic parsing rules for English language. And what we want to hear the test is how effective is learning complex knowledge versus learning the single rules as people used to do in the past. Okay, so we took this, uh, uh, this, this grammar, we tried to take bits uh, out of it, if you like, so assuming that what we know is only partial. We had a positive and negative example of sentences, don't worry about, try to read that, it's too small. Uh, doesn't matter, but sentences in English, so what is a sentence, what is not a sentence, and we were trying to see whether we can relearn the, not the grammar of the language in a correct, with a high predictive, good predictive accuracy. So if you then compare the, our system compared to the system that were at that time, it became obvious that once we learn two or three or four or multiple rules interdependent with each other, the accuracy is much higher, the less I know already about the system. So if I want to get a higher accuracy, the knowledge I want to learn, for example, has to be richer, cannot be just a single rules. And this is the case when there are single rules learned, okay? All right, so, but now, so what about the non-monotonic, the default things? So the default assumptions. So all we've done so far was learning complex rules, but not reasoning about defaults. And we wanted then to push the body of symbolic learning even further. So we wanted to learn rules which are, uh, so re reason about defaults, learn exceptions. This is really important nowadays. You know, most of the exceptions in machine learning, they get cut out because they're considered like outlier. Whereas actually the real behavior is sometimes in the exceptions. We want to be able to exploit that. We want to learn those exceptions and, uh, and learn the default conditions. So, imagine, so we took into account, we took a system, an example there of the London ambulance uh, system uh, where there was in the, around the 1992 or something like that. So what happened at that time is that they introduced something that was called a, 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 a computer-aided uh, dispatching services. So instead of having a human answering the emergency call, they had a software there. And the software was answering the emergency call and then uh, you know, sending a dispatch in the ambulance to the particular position, the place of the emergency. 
And within two to three months, the software resulted to be completely useless. The way the ambulance were going and not going when the system thought they were dispatched and not going in different locations and so forth. And the reason be because the representation of the knowledge in the system was incomplete. They had the situations about exception cases that were not predicted. And uh, if we want to reason about uh, the effect of events, we need to take into account uh, exceptions when events will not stop, that will stop events uh, from occurring. So what we really wanted to do is at the time is we take an execution traces of the system, we see when the system uh, succeeds or fail, and this becomes for us now label data, label example for the symbolic learner. So, and we were able, if we reason about negation and the default condition, we were able then to learn exception rules. And the what circuit is a very simple case, but there were much more complicated situations. So where, when the exceptions were occurring, and if the system can learn those exceptions, then they can use it in order to make a, a better prediction of the services that it provides. All right? So, so non-monotonic is essential, in my view. Okay? We then uh, can push this even further, and we did a lot of work on applying it as a non-monotonic symbolic learning in the context of software engineering in general. And we were really able to develop systems that could help the software engineer person, so this is like happy human-machine collaboration here, uh, on the performing tasks such as elaborations of a systems software models from scenarios, from partial description of the system behavior, refinement of the software model when there were errors in the software model, and the discovery of the software models. So in this case, we were only looking at logs of executions. We had no information about how the, what the model of the software behavior would be. We're looking at the logs and could we actually extract and learn automatically the model of the system that conforms to that log. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to go through all of this in detail, but there's a sequence. There's, you can look at this paper here. It's a nice summary about all the results. There are many papers published on that in collaboration with people here. Uh, in the department, and my, I should mention, my another ex-PhD student, uh, Dalala Raja, who is now an academic in this department. So this was an interesting uh, uh, piece of work we did together. So, but so far, logic seems to be a very rigid thing. We have examples, we have exceptions, we have, and, and, and so forth, but in reality, data is noisy, right? In reality, it doesn't come with a true or false. So how can we deal with the noise in the data? And the one work which I did together with another PhD student of mine was looking at how we can apply symbolic learning in order to learning domain models for adaptive systems. So this is a case of a robot that has to move in a certain space, and it's got an idea of what the domain or the environment is moving about it looks like. It's got a representation of that, but the environment changes all the time. So, and if the environment changes, how can the robot, through observing the effect of its own action, learn a better representation of the environment in which it is operating, okay? So this is the, con the concept of adaptive systems here. And um, so this, for this, to take into account the domain of a factory, robot in a factory. These were the plants that the robot were kind of generating, uh, in, given the model had about the domain. And uh, this was uh, representing to our system, and these were execution traces. So what action succeeded, what action failed in that the robot was actually performing. And using this information, we were able to do two things now, combine together qualitative learning, which is learning of the notion of success of actions in the particular environment, together with the quantitative learning, which is the probability distributions on top of this knowledge that we were learning. So that we will know, the robot will know what is the most likely notions of success of each of these actions together. And if we take this learned knowledge, the robot can then generate a completely different plan. And then what we demonstrate is that we can actually reduce the failure rate from 30% to 10%. So this idea of having machines that work in environment that can automatically learn by observing the effect of the actions was just a very effective way of doing that. Okay, but I said that I mentioned that in my title, we want to help humans. So another interesting application that we did for non-symbolic learning was really about learning human behavior. 
And uh, this is a situation in which uh, it was a project with EPSSC in the context of privacy domain, uh, where actually we were interested in learning uh, privacy policies. So we wanted to learn a you know, behavior that the device has to do in order to guarantee privacy for the human. And, uh, and the, the concept here is that, that the data that are used by the learner can be heterogeneous, can be the GPS locations, the vicinity to certain places, uh, contact information is a, is a large class of heterogeneous data. And uh, what uh, we wanted to do, so if you look at the, the hypothesis, the search space here was a massive search space given the value of each of these parameters. It was something of the form of 10 to the power of 147 of possible rules. So this is, was a very difficult task from the point of view of symbolic learning, all right? And uh, we were able to learn the rules about, uh, for instance, when the human tended to accept the phone calls or when they don't accept the phone calls. <coughs> so once we have these rules learned, the system can use these policies in order to self-adapt, to adapt itself in the particular situations when the rules tell accept or not accept the call until uh, new examples are come along, along, until the human rejected the system behavior and says, this is no good for me. And this becomes now a new example for the system itself. Uh, and uh, we were able then uh, to learn way of revising this knowledge. So it's not really a one-shot learning that you learn from scratch each time, but can we use uh, what we have learned so far and uh, revise it and improve it over time, okay? All right, so, um, this is takes now to, uh, and, uh, I had many other examples and I was just worried that I was running out of time to go through all of this. So I apologize if I missed some of my PhD students work here. So it's very difficult to fit, I don't know, 20 past years of work in this 50 minutes. But there is another thing, another aspect of the research that we've done very recently that really deserves mention. And it is the fact that we wanted to so I'm always really fascinated by how we can push forward the boundary of symbolic learning, right? I'm, not, I, I'm, I'm, I'm never happy to accept where we get to. I want to go a little bit a step further, all right? And really what we wanted to do here is if we want to learn a human behavior, we need to be able to learn the concept of human preferences. So humans make decisions based upon the preferences that they have in their head. And those preferences, a preference model, guides them in, in making their own decisions. So can we actually learn those human preferences so that the intelligent system can use this model in order to do a true personal support and guidelines to the particular humans, right? By using what the system believes the human preferences are. So we pushed even further the, 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 the state of symbolic learning and uh, we looked at uh, learning in our concepts such as the uh, preferences, non-deterministic behavioral systems, so performing an action, you can have a non-deterministic uh, uh, effect, uh, and, uh, and constraints, which is a very difficult concept to learn. So in order to do that, we moved towards a different type of uh, language and computational formalism called answer set programming. This nowadays is a very powerful uh, computational framework that actually uh, it's used in order to solve, uh, so, so search for solutions or problems which are NP hard. And uh, normally the way we, people use answer set programming is by taking a real world problem, modeling in this uh, language, in this programming language, computing a solution of this program, and this solution will correspond to the solution in the real world. So this is if, so this is if you do the modeling uh, manually. But in a learning point of view, we want to do completely the other way around. We want to start from a partial description of the real solution, the real world solution, and learn the model that learn the representation of the real world problem. Because if we have that model, we can apply many other situations and circumstances and be able to predict, to make our own predictions. So this is a really, we open here a new stream of research. Nobody really did the learning and answer set the programming. And we were able uh, with my uh, PhD, ex-PhD student Mark Lowe is sitting here in the audience. So we were able to do some very interesting results here. And we worked in an European project in trying to develop a system for helping humans in urban mobility in cities. 
So if you want to go from A to B, you normally give uh, a particular uh, the origin and destination, and Google Map will turn you a few uh, alternative ways, right? And these are done based on very general criteria, which I normally don't like it. In fact, I never listen to the navigator in my car. I always go the way I think I should go, right? Even though the navigator will tell me to go. This is an argument, a discussion with me and my husband all the time <laughs> when we drive. But anyway, so, so we want to really to have a system here that can learn the uh, preference of the human, so in order to give a personalized suggestion in, in urban mobility. So imagine that the human has uh, some preferences. So for instance, a particular person wants to avoid walking through area of a high crime rate, and uh, this is a preference much more important than minimizing the number of buses, which is much more important than minimizing the walking distance. So preferences can be ordered among themselves, okay? So, and then normally you write these preferences, this language, with what is called uh, soft constraints. But this is for those of you who understand that. Otherwise, don't worry about it. Okay, so the problem was, can we actually develop a, a software system that takes into account uh, uh, as an initial uh, preference model, and uh, when the human uh, pulls a request, uh, provides uh, some suggestions, and uh, also the system knows what would be the preferred route that the humans should take. Now, if the human rejects that preferred route and it does a, a different choice, so is now preferring a particular solution, a partial solution to another partial solution, this now becomes an ordered labeled example for our symbolic learner. And the symbolic learner can take the human preference here, choice, and continue learning a better model of, uh, of the human preferences. And this is done in order to, you know, in a way, continue learning. And what we tried to uh, evaluate, so actually, I forgot to say that the important bit here is whatever the system learned the preference to be can be automatically written in English to the human themselves. So this is the way we talk about interpretability of what the learning system is generating. So that the human can provide uh, you know, its own feedback and her own feedback to what the system has learned. So if you look about the execution, the performance of this system, we wonder, okay, how many examples does the system, count example needs to visit in order to give a good accuracy? And you can see it's just sufficient to get eight long suggestion over time to human to converge ready to over 80% of accuracy, right? And if the label, the examples, the decision, the choice that you know, make a noisy, because maybe it's a scatty person trying to decide something but doesn't really know why, so then uh, if the label are noisy, then you need 10 or 15 examples to get to the 80%. So this is demonstrated that this particular symbolic learning system are not data firstly. They don't need a mini example to get a very good level of accuracy. Okay, so where are we now? That's all the contributions that we have made in the area of symbolic learning. So we developed many systems since the early 2000s up to now, and they try to tackle the problems of learning complex knowledge where rules are nested, where are non-monotonic, where we can learn preferences and choices and non-determinism and so forth. And um, so we are very excited about where we are at the moment. So the message that I really would like you to take with you after this presentation is that in summary, uh, the notion of non-monotonicity was a great thing in AI, and uh, it should not be forgotten. We really needed to cover, to have languages that can use a non-monotonic uh, uh, concept and, and, uh, and the default assumption because these are essentially real world application. Then uh, reasoning explanations now has been advanced a lot in AI and it can be centralized or decentralized. Symbolic learning has done this, we've just shown you briefly, is an incredible advancement uh, and uh, with the capability of learning a complex knowledge. Uh, and knowledge-based AI, this is the general message here, has now developed, in my view, all the necessary tools to be able to make an its own impact in developing a truly intelligent system for the human. But in order to do this, so we done all of this, but in order to do that, uh, what is now the next step? And the next step is actually here. How can we, and this is really where we are working at the moment, 
uh, with uh, my current PhD students. How can we actually integrate, no, you know, machine learning has done a great advancement recently, but how can we find a way of integrating together the machine learning algorithm that we have now with the symbolic uh, uh, learning, a symbolic inference algorithm that we have developed so far? So two, not necessarily the only two, are the type of uh, objective that we try to work at the moment. And one is try, can we make the symbolic learning scalable, not just on data, but on the large search spaces. If you remember, I said learning means learning for solution on large search spaces. So in real domain, these search spaces are very big. So how can we make them scaling up on these large search spaces? And second, how can we do this integration? The machine learning can be different type of machine learning. We're talking about deep learning, reinforcement learning, statistical relational learning, and so forth. How can we combine these different uh, technologies together to really benefit, you, you know, exploit the benefits of both? And to the risk of doing a little bit of an advert here, I'm very pleased to say we already you know, put some seeds into this, and we got the two papers accepted now in AAAI 2020, which we're very pleased about. So working with my postdoc, Mark Rowe, uh, we developed a faster system, the symbolic learning system, that is actually able, you know, scaling much better with larger search spaces. And with a current PhD student of mine and Christian Daniel of Reros, we actually started to exploit this is the, the integration between reinforcement learning and symbolic learning by allowing reinforcement learning to learn what is called sub-goal automata. And we demonstrated that in this way, with this combination, we can be actually better and faster than just baseline reinforcement learning. So here is where I stop, and I would like to, I think I hope I haven't run over time, I would like just to give some uh, personal notes here. Um, there are three people that really have marked my career, and I needed to uh, really uh, um, sort of thank them. One is, uh, funny enough, Giovanni Pani. He's an academic at the University of Bari. I never had a chance really to work closely with him, and so I was uh, one of my teachers in my degree. And the reason why I really want to acknowledge him is because he was the one that told me to come to Imperia. When I was applying for my PhD in the US, he said to me, oh, don't go there, I go just to Imperial, it's a much better university. So I said, all right, so I'll try that. So, and if I wasn't for him, I don't think I would have been here today. So I would like to thank Dov Gabay, he's my you know, co-supervisor, as Daniel suggested. It was very inspirational at the beginning uh, in learning these different type of logics. Uh, I came from Bali knowing only classical logic, and so I had to do a steep learning curve. And Krisha Broda, who is actually my co-supervisor sitting here, and she's been an absolutely pleasure person to work with since then, really. So I don't know what I would have done if I don't have a collaboration with Krisha. So thank you, Krisha, for all the work you've done with me. And uh, so I would like to also acknowledge all my past students. This is my past PhD students. Some of them now are my postdoc here, so they haven't left yet. Hopefully, they will never leave. So, uh, and then uh, uh, I also would like to, and some, so some of the quite few actually sitting here, I'm very pleased to see all of you here, and uh, thank my current PhD student. So it's a big number here, and it's a big job to look after all of them. But we are really, I'm very excited because today I'm a fantastic student. I've learned so much through collaborating <laughs> with them, and I hope that the seeds we put with the AAAI paper is going to turn into a you know, fruitful plant one day, right? So, and lastly, I would like to thank my family. So I would like to thank Rob and uh, Rebecca and Natasha. They've been extremely supportive throughout all my life, all my career. And each time I was saying at home, shall I go to give this talk? Oh, should I not do it? It's too time consuming. And Natasha would always answer to me, yes, mom, of course you must do that. <laughs> so, and this is for me just, you know, having the kind of support is really what you need in order to push you to go forward in your life and in your career. And uh, this is now my closer collaborators. And actually, I should have thanked before my family, but it doesn't matter. So this, uh, I hope I haven't missed anybody. And that's the one I end up married <laughs> <laughs> when I was here. Okay, so I think that's all. Thank you very much.
I hope you've enjoyed that. I have. And I must tell you, Alessandra, I've got the final page here of research collaboration ideas for after this talk. So let me say that it was an absolute uh, pleasure and privilege to be asked to give this uh, vote of thanks after this talk for Alessandra. Alessandra has been a friend of mine. We've collaborated a little bit. Uh, but uh, as you have seen, she's an outstanding uh, researcher and an outstanding person. Last night, I went and met uh, Rob, her husband. And Rob thought that I came, I went to come to see him so we can talk together about this, this few words that I'm going to say. But I said, no, Rob, I came to see you. You remember, we were friends and we we're collaborators. Maybe we can start again. I know about uh, Alessandra. Don't worry, I know what to say. Today I had a few surprises, but what I want to say, I think, still, uh, still stands. Okay. And basically, without looking at my notes, what I want to say is that you might not recognize it through this talk, but Alessandra is a very, very courageous researcher. She doesn't stay in her own comfort zone. All of us, as, uh, most of us here probably are researchers, uh, we can choose to stay in our comfort zone. What we've learned from Barry, what we've learned from our supervisors, our kind of thing, and then we can stay in there and we can carry on our research in there. She's very courageous. She, she's not scared to get out of it and do what is needed, actually, as she explained very well today, for AI to be done properly. If AI is going to be done and it's going to be sustainable, it's going to have ideas that will endure over time, you have to do the kind of thing that Alessandra is doing. So if she's courageous to get out of her comfort zone and go to somewhere else. It takes a lot of effort, believe me, to get a little bit out of your comfort zone and, and learn what other people are doing and bring things together, build these bridges. But as you have seen, she's, she's building these bridges. And the, the outstanding thing about her, and that's what it needs to be a professor at Imperial College, is that you've got to get out, but you've still got to be solid in your work. And this is what she's doing. She's solid throughout, and yet, even when she's working within areas she knows well, when she branches out to build the bridges, she's still solid. So thanks. So uh, I can tell you, uh, in, uh, the first time I've experienced this courage is when when I came to work with, uh, with her, and um, I came and she said to me, well, we're going to work on network security, firewall, f firewalls. And I said, God, what is firewalls? I mean, I, I thought this, this lady was a logician, or we're going to work on network. And we worked on network security, and she given me some of that courage. I have a little bit of courage to jump out as well, as you might know. But uh, she's given me a little bit more courage to be able to, to do these things. Now, let me say again, AI, to be done properly, you need to, to bring together engineering all the way down to philosophy. Okay? And we've seen from her work here how you really got to bring, start bringing these things uh, together. So uh, another way of putting this courage thing is that, you know, She's not afraid to get out of this popular zone. She's not afraid to get out of her comfort zone. She's not afraid to get out of the popular zone. You know, this popular zone, go and do the AI as it's uh, hyped up in the, in, in the media. And uh, if you're especially a young researcher, maybe you want to do that because if you're in the mainstream, you might have an easier career path. But she's not afraid to be outside the popular zone and to fight her own corner. So that's, again, another way of the, uh, another big uh, uh, sample of her courage. So uh, she's tough in her work, but as you have uh, heard, she's, she's, very, she's a very gentle and caring person. You can see that from the way that she mentors her students. You see how many students she has, okay? And you've, see, you've heard throughout, throughout the, uh, the talk all about the students, that basically it's, it's the students who are doing this work, not Alessandra. I'm, uh, I'm, just, I'm just helping them, uh, helping them along. She's a very gentle, caring person as a personality. Okay. She, she loves her family, as you have seen. She's tolerant with Rob, 
as you have, <laughs> as you have, as you might have uh, guessed. And you know, okay, in mixed marriages, in the sense mixed, mixed uh, as I know as well, you need to you need to have a bit of higher level of tolerance on both sides, of course. Okay, and um, if you, those who have worked with her, and those who will work with her, as you, as you have heard, you will actually um, uh, learn this uh, experience from the first hand. This 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 very gentle personality, but tough at work because she wants the work to be absolutely watertight, even when you're branching in different in different things. She's also a, a, a lover of music, and I don't know if you get a chance to to uh, experience uh, her playing on the, on the piano and things like that. So this is a vote of thanks. So thank you, Alexander. Thank you very much. So there are people guiding you, so and I'm happy to chat to anybody who has made all the way here. So I'm having Joe myself. And thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.